of fire. In his diary he wrote, I found a street covered six to ten feet in yellow, red or black wood ashes, mixed with thoroughly burned fragments of bricks and stones. Schliemann decided that the street he'd uncovered must be the royal road to the palace of Priam, king of Troy. He was now uncovering ramparts as massive as the mighty walls of Troy Homer had described in detail. But beyond coins and towers, Schliemann wanted to find evidence of the woman at the heart of the legend, Helen of Troy. Along the way, he would find and marry his own Helen, a young Greek girl who also loved Homer and dedicated herself to her new husband's expedition. They would be satisfied with nothing less than royal treasure. After years of digging, Schliemann was close to losing heart. Then one day, his eye caught the glint of metal in a wall. He dismissed the workers and scrabbled through the rocks with his bare hands. This required great exertion and great risks, since the wall of fortification beneath which I had to dig threatened every moment to fall down on me. But the sight of so many objects, every one of an unestimable value to archaeology, made me reckless. It seemed certain they once lay in a wooden chest of the kind mentioned by Homer as being in Prime's palace. He boldly announced he had discovered the treasure of Priam. From the wall, he pulled vases of silver, weapons of copper, 60 gold earrings, nearly 9,000 gold rings, and exquisite tiaras and necklaces. It was one of the world's richest archaeological finds. That night, he laid the treasure out in his hut. His wife put on one of the magnificent gold tiaras. They were sure she was wearing the jewels once worn by Helen of Troy. Not all Schliemann's claims would be confirmed, but he did uncover the remains of a city destroyed by war and fire 4,000 years ago, and it did contain treasure beyond price. Legend became reality. Was this a step back towards a time when even Atlantis might have existed? Certainly, Troy did exist. But what of Homer's other great stone citadel, Mycenae, and its legendary king, the mighty Agamemnon? Having finally defeated the Trojans, ancient myth records the Greek king's voyage home. He expected a hero's welcome. Clytemnestra, his wife, had other plans. On the hills above his palace at Mycenae, guards stood watch with orders to light beacons the moment Agamemnon's ship came into view. They would also tell Clytemnestra. In the ten years Agamemnon had been away, she had taken a lover. Together, they plotted their own welcome for the hero. A great celebration greeted Agamemnon's return, but when the feasting was over, the queen and her lover slipped unnoticed into the royal bathroom. Clytemnestra had long nursed a deep hatred for her husband. Before departing for Troy, he had sacrificed their daughter to the gods to ensure victory. Not with a random, unconsidered blow, but from old hate. And with maturing time, here where I struck, I take my rooted stand upon the finished deed. Here Agamemnon lies, my husband dead.
On a hilltop at Mycenae lie the ruins of an ancient fortress. Schliemann concluded it must be King Agamemnon's great palace, with a magnificent gateway guarded by enormous sculptured lions. Look at the citadel of Mycenae here. It's really the best example in all of Greece of the power that these people had. The citadel sits up on this eminence of rock and it commands the whole plain. Among the ruins, Schliemann found skeletons buried in strange circular patterns, but his dream was to uncover the grave of Agamemnon himself and the treasure he was sure would lie with it. Schliemann decided to start digging in this area because his reading informed him, in his opinion, that he would find somewhere within these walls that you see the graves of people like Agamemnon. He got down into the bedrock where the graves were located and was aware that he was getting into Mycenaean material. He found 19 clearly royal skeletons surrounded by gold treasure more than justifying Homer's description of a gold-rich Mycenae. It was a treasure even more spectacular than he'd found at Troy. But then he made the most exciting discovery of all, a gold mask molded to the likeness of the face beneath it. In Schliemann's mind, the mask could only have belonged to one man. Recording this discovery, he wrote, I have gazed on the face of Agamemnon. After 3,000 years, such precise identification is impossible. But from their skulls, what these people actually looked like can now be determined. This is the skull of a middle-aged Mycenaean woman, gradually being fleshed out in a laboratory in Manchester, England. Schliemann's Agamemnon skull couldn't be restored from the few pieces that were found, but many skulls from other Mycenaean grave circles were much better preserved. So we ended up with, with seven, six men, one woman, uh, from different parts of the grave circle, some from the same graves, some from completely separate parts. And it was very exciting because Richard doesn't know what they're going to look like until he's put the face on. The skull is the frame of the face. The skull dictates what comes onto the face. He can't control it. This is going to have a hump in the nose because the nasal bone is bent down. I'm told that she might be Clytemnestra. And certainly, from what I recall of my history, Clytemnestra was not one of the world's nicest ladies, although she obviously had considerable womanly charms. A clear picture of the Mycenaeans began to emerge. They must have been fairly sophisticated, though. Fairly sophisticated. The fact that they've gone to the trouble to make their hair in this kind of style, to spend time preparing their hair, means, A, they had time on their hands to do it. And in a society which is really struggling for survival, um, my own personal feelings are that probably fancy hairstyles would have been a somewhat lower priority. <laughs> Hairstyling for the dead demands inspired guesswork. People are not always going to have their hair in exactly the same style all the time. time. Yes. I mean, yes. is she at a ball? Is she gardening? Has she yes. just got up? Yes. No, Richard Neves' time. reconstructions are so accurate the police seek his help with skulls of unknown murder victims. Relatives often make identifications from his models. But what did Neve think of the Mycenaean men? A bunch of thugs. A bunch of thugs. Richard's quite right when he says they're thugs. They're big men, by and large. Um, we've got people of five foot eight, five foot nine. They're well nourished. Uh, a lot of them have very good teeth, not all of them. We've got some horrendous abscesses. We've got people with arthritis, uh, probably from carrying too many shields, heavy shields. The interesting thing was these are the first rulers of Greece, the first rulers of Mycenae. Homer called the Mycenaeans the strongest generation of earthborn mortals. 
In the grave circles, Schliemann found weapons that precisely...